This Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on Wednesday, July the 6th in the year 2011 here at the Niles Public Library. My name is Neil O'Shea and I'm a member of the reference staff and I'm speaking with Mr. John McCann. Mr. McCann was born on October the 5th, 1924 uh, and he now lives, he was born in Chicago. He now lives in Prospect Heights and Mr. McCann learned of our project here at the Niles Library through his son Kevin. Uh, and Kevin is here present uh, in the room as we conduct uh, this interview in the group study room here in the reference department at the Niles Public Library. Uh, Mr. McCann has kindly consented to be interviewed for this project and we're grateful for that. Uh, so Mr. McCann, uh, do you recall when you entered the, uh, the service of the, of the United States Navy? Well, I was going to DePaul University and luckily I had got a deferment until June of 43 and uh, then my number came up in the draft and I went down another fellow, a friend of mine lived down the street we went down and uh, at the time you didn't get your choice of service whatever they needed, Army, Navy or Marines that's what happened so we went down and uh, one of the guys told me, he says, kid, I'll give you a tip. Get behind the biggest, strongest guy you can find and get up near the front of the line. So, okay, I found the guy and uh, it looked like Dick Butkus. So, um, we, um, he got up in front of me. He was second, I think. I was third. And they asked him, Army, Navy, or Marines? And he said, Navy, Marines he got. I said, uh-oh. So, I'm next. Puny little 150 pound me, and they said Army, Navy, or Marines. Navy! I got Navy, so that was a lucky day for me. So we went home that night. We were supposed to report the next morning, a friend of mine and I, and we got back the next day, and they told us to go home. They didn't need us for another day. So I went home, my mother was hanging the wash in the backyard, and I told her the Navy didn't want me. You know, and I mean, I'm only kidding, i got to go back tomorrow. So we go back the next day, it's July of 43, hot, humid days. I got a t-shirt on, I got a toothbrush, I don't even know if I was shaving it or not. And that was it. So we get on the North Shore train, said, we're going to the Great Lakes, that's wonderful. So we're on the train for three hours, and somebody said, what the heck, we've been on this train for three hours. Great Lakes is only 25 miles away, so somebody says, you're not going to Great Lakes, lads. So old John McCann, the expert on topography, I look out the window, I says, good, we're going southwest, we're going to San Diego. Couldn't get a better spot. So we get to Colorado, and all of a sudden, we're going northwest. So I said, what the heck is this? So four days later, no clothes, no toilet articles, nothing. We're, we all stink and so on. We end up in Spokane, Washington. And uh, we spent an overnight in Spokane. They weren't ready for us. We were going to a place 30 miles away called Farragut, Idaho. Farragut, Idaho was a piece of land that Eleanor Roosevelt's family owned and sold it to the government and it was a naval base up there, 30 miles south of the Canadian border. So the next day, a bus took us over there, and they took us over, and we got our clothes, and we got our shots, and the whole bit, and we were all set to start on the following day. Boot camp took about eight weeks. Beautiful countryside, and the only thing I knew about it was Bill Bean Crosby had a house on Lake Ponderé. He used to come and do trout fishing. So we had a tough commanding uh, drill sergeant, he wasn't a sergeant, he was a CPO, chief petty officer, his name was Dobson, and uh, he would really put us through terrific drilling and so on. And every once in a while, he would be stuck with the midnight to four shift uh, to supervise the area. So what he would do, as we found out later, he would come in around 10 after 12 and scatter papers on the floor. And, uh, you know, 
And then they turn the lights on. All right, what the hell is all this stuff on the floor? That's terrible. Okay, everybody up out on the grinder. He was because he couldn't stay awake, probably. So he'd take us out on the grinder and he'd run us for you know an hour or so. So that was one thing he always did. But uh, he was a very good instructor. We learned a lot about the Navy. So when it came time to leaving, we were entitled to an 18-day uh, furlough. And uh, I already applied for radar school. First, I wanted to be an aerographer's mate. That would be a weatherman, but I didn't get that. And I got radar school. So I went home, and 18 day, it was 1,850-mile train ride. And then when I came back, we headed for San Diego. And I went to uh, radar school in San Diego. It was a four- or five-week school in a place called Point Loma. Beautiful. I fell in love with San Diego. The weather was great. And uh, on the train going there, I met a fellow from St. Paul, Minnesota, Jack McMonica. And he and I were together then until the end of the war. Just happened to be lucky. And we went to radar school together. And when we finished radar school, we were sent up to San Francisco to get our ship. Well, what you would do is there was a big room and a big bulletin board and listing all the ships and the names of different people and you would look to see your name on a ship. So we had a few nights that we were free uh, for liberty. So one night he came and told me, we're on the same ship, we're on the USS Case. I said, I, I looked at the bulletin board and there's our name. So lo and behold, we went over to the case. A 1938 commission destroyer, 1,850 tons, uh, and uh, it was being repaired. It had gone to Alaska in November, and it had suffered damage, highways and different damage, and they were repairing it, and they wanted to get us out as quickly as possible. So we spent, we spent uh, time there, and then we left just before Christmas of 43, headed for the Hawaiian Islands. I uh, remember going to Mass at Hawaiian Islands and the Hawaiian choir, the kids sang. It was terrific. It was really good. So while there, we would go out during the daytime and practice firing. We would shoot at air targets. Uh, they would tow, uh, tow a sleeve and we would fire at the sleeve and uh, you, they would tell you how well you did. Well, then all of a sudden, we get the word we're shipping out. Uh, one thing I forgot, on the way to the Hawaiian Islands, we passed underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. Every one of the new recruits were sicker than dogs, seasick. And the more seasick we were, the regular crew guys were going to say, I'll tell you what to do, rookie. Eat. I can't eat. I just feel force food down. So we listened to them, and here we are forcing our meals down, and it's coming up over the side, and they're laughing like cat. So, yes, the only time I was seasick in my 30 months in the Navy, even during typhoons and very bad storms, never had another uh, siege of seasickness. So we head out uh, in January of 44 for the Marshall Islands invasion. And uh, we went out there, and there was, I remember, in the Weetak was one island we were associated with, and another one was Majuro, and another one was Kwajalein. Kwajalein was uh, the biggest of the three, and it was an important Japanese base. And I remember the Marines had gone in there, and everything was pretty much laid to waste, and we would go through there, and the Marines would swim out from the, the island, selling Japanese flags, selling to tokens, you know. And uh, so uh, we didn't fool with that because we were moving all the time. So we went on and then uh, out to sea again, and we later went, uh, we had a captain, he was an old Navy man, his name was Captain Commander Howe, H-O-W-E, terrific captain, he knew his story, he treated everybody well. And suddenly he got transferred out. And this young whippersnapper, Lieutenant Commander Wiley, W-I-L-E-Y, he comes in to take over the captaincy, real cocky. And I said, uh-oh, we're going to have trouble with this guy. And sure enough, we did. So we're heading down for New Guinea. And uh, on the way down, 
we crossed the equator and we had to go through the inducted King Nephews. And a, a, a guy, the elastic guy gave me about being up in the front of the line paid off again for the second time. I got up behind the biggest, strongest guy and they always brought up charges against you. Uh, it seemed up to his court. And one of my charges was that I knew more about basketball than one of the uh, one of the shellfish. That, uh, and another charge was that I was a boom, a boom sissy or a college sissy and the things they make up and so on. So they force you to drink the most distasteful concoction. It's diesel oil plus many other things and you drink it and you it hits bottom and it comes right up again. And you're sitting in the chair and there's a canvas pool behind you and guilty or not guilty. And you're, you're naturally you're guilty. You're not going to. So then they push a button and the chair is charged and you go over backwards into the pool and they're pushing you up and down in the water and they're yelling Pollywag, Pollywag, and you're yelling shellback. That's what you want to be, a shellback. And the Pollywag is the lowest form of life, uh, lower than a whale's belly, they say. So the good part was I was number three in line. Once you finish all the initiation, now prior to the court date with King Neptune, they had to do all kinds of uh, things like going down to the engine room with winter clothes, running up down, running up to keep warm. It was about 180 in the engine room. And, and then actually looking with two Coke bottles, looking all over the side to see if you see any Japanese ships and so on. Well, to make a long story short, after I finished, I got in line. And once you're in line, I knew ahead of time, you can paddle anybody that's ahead of you. And so it was a long line as I went through. They paddled my backside pretty good. But then I got at the end of the line and I got my paddle out. And there were a few guys that I wanted to paddle. Well, this new captain, he got his ass tanned pretty well because they couldn't do anything to him legally. But in an introduction to the Neptune court, they had to go. So we went down to Hollandia, New Guinea. And uh, while down there, we were involved in, uh, in Hollandia. There was a Japanese midget sub that had sunk a tanker. And uh, we came across the Japanese sub, midget sub, and the quartermaster was the one that did all the work. He went, he went and they split the sub in half. But the captain took the credit for it. The captain was the one that did this and did that. And the captain got the awards, like all oh, that happened and so on. So that was that. And then that later on we started going, we went back north to the Marianas operation. And uh, that was Tinian, Guam, and Saipan. And uh, that was uh, pretty tough. We had a lot of Japanese planes. We were closest to Japan. So then after the Marianas, we went over to the Philippines. And that was the Philippine Islands invasion. And uh, while there, that was a famous Turkey shoot over the Pacific when our plane shot down most of the Japanese Air Force and as well as uh, the Japanese fleet. They were coming in and we were assigned and most of the destroyers were assigned a torpedo attack on the Japanese battleships. We were scared stiff because the largest battleship afloat, the Yamato, that was supposed to be one of the battleships. Well, as luck would have it, they went so far through the Suriago Straits and they decided that it wasn't going to work out and they turned back and they went south. So that was the Battle of the Philippine Sea. Next, we go up to the Iwo Jima invasion. And uh, the surprising thing about the Iwo Jima invasion, our task force, 58, bombarded Iwo Jima five different times, from one end of the island to the other end. And at the same time, the Air Force dropped bombs 65 straight days. And after we, afterwards, we found out it only killed 20 Japs out of 20,000 that were on the island. So then comes the invasion of Iwo, and it was a terrible slaughter for our men. Eventually, now we were out in the water, so we were pretty well safe. And the Japs, uh, at this time, started using the kamikazes, Japanese planes that were willing to sacrifice themselves. And they would come over and they would try to run right into your ship. And so um, at this time, 
Uh, Okinawa was the hot spot. But we were over by the Iwo and by the Bahamas. So uh, one night I'm on the radar and I see a contact far away, far away. And I uh, said to the, one of the guys next to me, take over to the set. I want to go out. I look and I look and I see lights in the distance. And I said, uh, Captain wants to know, I told him about the contact. And I said, Captain, facetiously, it's either a gambling ship or a hospital ship. There are no hospital ships out here and so on. I said, well, that's what it looks like. So lo and behold, he checks the books and there's a hospital ship. So he wants to board the hospital ship with an armed crew. And he got contacted the commander of our task force and the commander told him, absolutely not. No. And we find out afterwards they were going into Chichijima, which is the island north of Iwo, with troops and with ammunition and other military goods. Had we boarded it, it would have been really a coup for the captain. So uh, uh, that was right just before the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. And when the uh, uh, bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, we went over to Chichijima and they brought back all kinds of guns. Rifles, Japanese rifles. Everybody on the ship got a Japanese rifle. And uh, so this captain of ours, I was telling you a story about uh, he didn't think it was a hospital ship. One time we got a message. All the ships had code names. And the code names were changed periodically. And one night, about 9, 9.30, Tulagi, this is stagehand, Nancy Hanks, the captain calls out, what was that? What was that? Dancing Tanks? I said, no, I think, I think, I think he said Nancy Hanks. And all of our code books were named to pe different people and so on. And he says, I never heard of Nancy, Nancy Hanks. And I said, that was Abe Lincoln's mother's maiden name. And uh, so he looked in the book, and the book says, man, your night, uh, your night, uh, signal center. He had a special deal for night. They wanted to send a message, so they finally did that. So after that, that was a pretty good paper with the captain. And he would call down and he would say, uh, my radio frequency is not too clear. Could you do something about it? Let McCann handle it. So I'd go over to the table and there was a jar. Nothing in the jar, just a jar that we used to put stuff in. And I would twist it around twice. How is it now, Captain? Much better. Thanks a lot, Matt. So uh, we go back, and we're there, and uh, we go back, and we got, we're finally get our orders to go back to the States for Navy Day. And we were lucky to be sent to New York City for Navy Day, 45, October of 45. And uh, we go through, we go through uh, the Panama Canal, which was a great experience, went around through Panama, Cologne, up the, the Atlantic, and I thought we were going to go down off Cape Hatteras, the roughest water we had endured. It was just right on, you could see North Carolina in the distance, about was rougher than that. Luckily, we got by, we got to New York. And so we were on the Hudson River, and Truman was going to come by and review the fleet. And we were staying at a hotel uh, in New York, the Dixie Hotel. We had free liberty, we had a wonderful deal, and we were there for like five or six days. After that, we went down to Norfolk, Virginia to decommission. And decommissioning, I thought they would take inventory of all the stuff on the ship. Take what you want. What? Take what you want. You guys are taking radio sets and everything. And uh, we had all kinds of things, the inventory, and inventory nothing. Deep six it, throw it over the side of the thing. And I couldn't believe it. So they did all that stuff, and we end up in Norfolk, and we get the word. We had to wait till our discharge, and my friend McMonico, and in order to stay out of working parties, the guy told me, keep moving, don't stand too low on the one spot. So we'd be going moving. And they had these films, uh, military films, and Reagan was in a lot of them. Reagan was in a lot of them. And there's one film. It was about getting the VD and so on. And so McDonald's in the McDonald's in this theater, and he, told, he tells me, he's looking up at the screen, 
and he had put it up there, John McCann, come out to the lobby. Just when they're skinning the guy down, you know. So I come out to the lobby, he says, come on, we got our, we got our orders to go home. So we hop our train, come back to Chicago in uh, December of 45, and we're sent to Navy Pier awaiting our discharge. And from Navy Pier we went to Great Lakes and we were discharged effective January 22nd, 1946. And four days later I returned to Nepal for my sophomore year. Well done. <laughs> the, um, was it, did you have any difficulty readjusting to life? No, because I went to Nepal during my freshman year, and all these, I was on the GI Bill, so Uncle Sam was paying for everything, and uh, it was a terrific deal for me to be able to start into school right away. I originally, uh, back in 43, I originally started at St. Ambrose. I got very homesick at St. Ambrose, and my dad came and got me. Is that in Davenport? Davenport, yeah. Luckily, DePaul hadn't started yet. So I still had time, I started my freshman year at DePaul, and it was a very smart move. So after I got out in January of 46, I started at DePaul. I was a year ahead of everybody. And by doing that, and by going to the summer school, I was able to graduate in 48. June of 48, I was able to start my master's degree, and it was all in GI Bill. So on the graduation day, or when I graduated, I got a call from Father Wangler down in DePaul. There were eight of us that got the call. Would you like to teach at the academy? I said, I never thought of it. I sure would. Different priests or professors had recommend different students. And a Father Jeremiah Lahane, who taught Irish literature. I had, yeah. I had him for a couple of classes. Terrific guy. He had recommended me. Never knew about it until I got to the academy and uh, somebody, one of the priests told me, Father Jerry Lehane recommended you. I said, geez, I was so glad to find out. And I found him and thanked him. So I started a teaching at the academy in uh, 48 and uh, spent four years there teaching. It was a great experience, and I met a lot of good people. And then when I finished in 40, 52, I came to the Board of Ed. And from the Board of Ed, from a teacher to a system principal to a principal, and uh, that's spent my days in education. When you started at DePaul, that, that fall after you switched from, uh, from St. Ambrose, yes. did you know you were going to be going to, into teaching at that time? Not really. Not really. I uh, really didn't really know what I wanted to do, but uh, somehow I started taking courses. I remember taking certain teachers, and I, then I said eventually after the, in my first year that I think I want to be a teacher. So you tell about your father's military service. Oh, well, as a kid, we'd be in a bar, and these guys are talking about the Battle of the Marne and Chateau Thierry and World War One, and you know, the old man would say. What are you guys talking about? Did you ever try to get out of Grand Ave in your streetcar on a Friday night when a Montgomery Ward would break? You know, he was at Navy Pier. He was a plumber. He got. He was told when he came there the first day, carry a wrench around with you. Anybody stops you, they want you to do something. Can't. Captain wants me to take care of the urinals. He spent nine months there. He got discharged. They gave him a nickel. That's all it cost on the Grand Ave in the streetcar to go home. So he, he loved it there. Tell me so, about, about the Spanish class at DePaul. Oh, well, yeah. I had taken Spanish one, two, and three during my one year at DePaul. So I came back, not only me, but other guys too. Conversation Spanish. Forget it. Forget it. Guy told me, take the class. Everybody else in the class, they're all GIs. They're, they, don't, they don't know any more Spanish than you do. And it's a little bit, so I took the class. First day, we're down to about 12. Third day, we're down to about 8. And I remember the teacher, Dr. Saba, you know, he's not going to have a class if it keeps going. So we didn't talk too much conversation Spanish. But the final report was a two-minute speech in Spanish. I memorized 
los apenices atacaron a los Estados Unidos el diciembre, 6 de diciembre, no, I think it was all the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. I just memorized it. If you would have asked me a question about it, I don't think I would have known the answer. So I passed the course. Instead of repeating Spanish 1, Spanish 2, Spanish 3, I finished my language background at DePaul. It was a great, a great thing for me. The, um, what neighborhood in Chicago did you live in? I came, we always talked in parishes. Yeah. I came from Presentation Parish on the west side, 756 South Springfield. Uh, my, my, my dad had gone to Presentation in grammar school. My mother and father were married in Presentation. Uh, so I went there. I li actually, I went into the public schools my first four years. We lived over my first three and a half years. We lived over west of the Presentation. It was too far to go. So we moved in 34 to 39, 39 Pope Street, and the school was right down the street. So I went there and finished there, and then I went to St. Philip in high school. The Servites, right? I really should have gone to St. Mel's, but for one thing, you know what it was? They had the ROTC, you had to wear the ROTC uniform. And I said, that's coming soon enough, I'm not going to go through that. So I went to the St. Philip, and I graduated in... Uh, uh, 42 from St. Philip, and I made a lot of good contacts, so and that's when I went to DePaul uh, before I went to service. So were you the, um, so your father was in the Navy? Yes. He was a plumber. Uh, they didn't call it a plumber. They call it, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, machinist mate or something like that. And would that have affected your choice of a oh, plumber? I think so. I think so. Yeah. And my uncle, my father's brother, who lived with him at the early end of his life, he was on the Mercy Marine Armed Guard. And the Armed Guard would man the any aircraft guns. And uh, the rest of the crew were regular sailors who were, they would be being paid. To, and it was very dangerous work. Oh, going across the Atlantic. Yeah, the losses. The same losses were really heavy, heavy, yeah. yeah. So when, after the your service and then we begin to talk. We, did you stay in touch with Mr. McGowan? I did. I did stay in touch with him and I eventually started working at DePaul for Coach Meyer in sports publicity. And we went up to play in Minnesota up in, up in Minneapolis and I remember that's the last time I saw him. Well, that would have been uh, oh, let me see. 60, 61 or something like that. We used to correspond with, and then eventually we stopped stop writing. Yeah. Were you the only member, did you have brothers and sisters that were affected by World War II or? I had, uh, my brother Bobby was younger than me and uh, he was too young to go in World War II but he was right for anything to happen afterwards. So in 1947 out of the clear blue sky he told my mother and dad I, I joined that I joined the mountain troops out in Colorado. You, yeah, he joined the mountain troops. No war is on now at this time, just before the Korean War. So he went on to Carson, Camp Carson and did his time and he got out just before the Korean War started. He lucked out. My youngest brother, Jim, who's dead now, he joined the Navy. And the reason why I didn't join the Navy and the draft deal if he had joined, he got to go for four years. If he got in, like when I got into draft, it was duration and six months when you could get out of it and so on. So he did his four years, and he did his probably uh, between the Korean War and the Vietnam War. The, um, how do you think your military service and your experiences in World War II might have affected your life? Well, one thing I wondered about is my eyes from watching that radar set all the time. Uh, I had trouble with my eyesight. I got glaucoma. And uh, I just wondered if that might have been caused, but that's just a guess and so on. Do you, th do you think your military experience has I influenced your thinking about war or about armed forces in general? About life in general, right, yeah. Uh, on the ship, we had people on the ship. We had one guy, 
He was a radio technician, which was the most important job on the ship. He took care of the sonar, radio, radar, everything. And one captain, going back quite a few years, gave him permission to be first in the chow line. And boy, that would rankle everybody else. He was a Mexican Swede. You don't find too many Mexican Swedes. And so when we're in the States, before we have to go out to the Pacific, everybody's ashore at Liberty, and he's carrying boxes on him. What the hell is he doing with all those boxes and stuff? He had a place to put it, because he had two blockers and the other places. Nobody else had that kind of space. So we'd be out to sea, and we had a few ship stores, you know, not much. We'd be out to sea two or three weeks, all of a sudden a little motor would go up on the bulletin board. Candy bars, $25. Planters peanuts, $35. Playing cards, $10. He was in business. And so he, he would yell at him and say, you don't have to buy a chicken. That's how he would say, you don't have to buy a chicken. And uh, he had chronic seasickness. You and I could be sitting at the table, you could be Andy. I'd go like this. He'd get sick. He'd get sicker than a dog. Yeah, he back and forth. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, he got permission from the captain to sleep topside. He had a hammock. He would hang it at night, and he'd sleep topside. So one night we said, we're going to fix this guy. We tied it in the hammock. Abandoned ship. Oh, man, abandoned ship. And he said, oh, look at this. Abandoned ship. He had foxes. He had a knife. He was able to cut his way through. He was able to get out of the hammock and so on. But uh, everybody detested him. He just was that type of a person. But I suppose he was good at his. Oh, crap. wonderful! That good. It was a, took a good t and that's why the captain could fix anything, anything to do with electronics. That's a remarkable interview, Mr. McCann. You just were able to go through all these periods of service without hesitation. Uh, is there anything you would like to add to the interview? Do you think we haven't covered? Or? Well, one thing. Um, uh, I didn't have a girlfriend. 1943, uh, spring of 43, I went over to St. Anne's Hospital. One of the kids on our basketball team, Red Gibbons, Eugene, uh, UB Gibbons, had a knee operation. So I went over to visit him at St. Anne's. He was a year behind me at St. Philip. And lo and behold, in the room were these two gorgeous girls. One of the dimples, and I said, boy, look at her, that's for me. And then I found out that she had a boyfriend in service, and she was two years older. So I said, I, I, so I told Red, I said, I forget about it. So I get a, I get a note from him uh, in service that her boyfriend was killed in uh, Operation Market Garden. It was a paratrooper. Yeah. And uh, that was Montgomery's mistake. You know, bridge too far, you know, they, they, they jumped and they all ended up in the water or dead before they hit the ground. Well, luckily his name was Bill O'Keefe. He was alive, but uh, he shot up pretty badly. He went to the, and he died. Uh, he died. So uh, I wrote to Kay, my future, my wife. Yeah. Was not on the could be a nursing home. She'd been in a nursing home for 14 months. So she corresponded back. And when I got out of service, I went over and she only lived a block and a half from me. And oh, uh, yeah. what a deal. So uh, I asked her out. We went to see Sonia Henney at the Chicago Stadium. And that started our relationship. And she said, I realized that your student at DePaul, forget about date night. And Wednesday was called date night. Every Wednesday you're supposed to take your date out and so on. She said, if you could come out Wednesday, if you can't, forget about it. And then near the end of my second year, and then I was going to be in the, going to teaching, she said, I'll wait for you until you graduate and get a job, which was really something not many girls would say. So I graduated in 48, and I got the job at DePaul Academy, and so we made plans then. I said, we're getting married in 49. She was agreeable, except my mother got cancer in April of 49, and the doctors gave her four months to live. 
So, in September of 49, I'm teaching a class at DePaul Academy, and the principal called me down to the office to tell me my mom had passed away. And she had said she was so good that morning when I left the house. So, uh, we had set our date, and my mother told me before she died, don't change the date because of me. So, we were married December 17th, uh, 1949. And the reason why I got married then was I had two weeks off from the academy, and it was at that, you know, you weren't supposed to get married at that. That's right. But Father Ryan, the principal, says, go ahead, I give you permission. So uh, we go down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We took the train down. We went to the Trade Winds Hotel, and I'm walking in with a luggage and so on. I have Mr. McCain. What? A kid from the academy, a senior, Dan Allen, is sitting in the lobby with his parents. They had gone down to the same hotel and so on. So they were real nice to us down there. They took us out and we had to go down. What are the odds of getting a kid from the high school and when you would go on your honeymoon like that? So then we, uh, we moved in with my uh, in-laws. They had a two flat on 179 North Le Mans. So the deal was, we spend the first year there, and then the second year we take over the first floor. Well, after we're there the first nine, ten months, the guy on the first floor, he didn't make a no move. And he was heavy politically. His uncle was superintendent of the sewer. So, we had to take him into court. So, somebody told me, forget about it, it's fixed. Don't waste your money going into court. So my dad, I told my dad, and my dad knew a guy named El Horan, who was the chief bailiff, and he was very powerful politically. He says, what do you do in a case like this when the case is fixed? It's their building. You know, my son and daughter-in-law, they want the flat. The other people aren't going to move. Well, you, you unfix the fix. <laughs> and I've never heard that term before. And so we get to court, and the guy downstairs, his name was Moorhead. He was stunned when the judge says, I'll give you 30 days to get out. What? See, they had unfixed the fix, and so we ended up, and we spent uh, another nine years there, and in 59, well, Kevin was born in 51, and John was born in 56, and in 59, we bought a house in St. Ferdinand's. Be nice house, well-structured, well-built in the 20s. By craftsmen, they took credit for their work, you know, and we had a, we had a goal of 25000 and my father was a plumbing contractor. He says, this is the place you want. 5643 West Henderson. I'll give you the 2000 So we, we paid 27 for it. And we had a lot of good years there. And uh, we were there until, uh, trying to think, 85 when I retired from the Board of Ed. My sister-in-law and brother-in-law, my brother-in-law was chief executive officer of the Railroad Retirement Board, 844 North Fresh. They just called the building another name. They just said, Pardon? Lepinski. Lepinski, yeah, William Lepinski building. And uh, he was 57, heavy smoker, died of uh, aspergillosis. Ever heard of it? The term with the lungs. And my sister-in-law, 41 years at the telephone company, a supervisor, retired, breast cancer, one monthly pension check when she died. And so I said, I'm getting out at 60. So I'm a principal of Agassiz School, and I had a Chinese assistant principal. Well, that was funny because I had an Irish lady as my assistant principal, and when she uh, retired, they told me to hire a minority, meaning black. So I looked around, and I knew this guy, Charlie Lee, from a neighboring school. So I asked him if he wanted to come over with me as the assistant principal. He said, absolutely. So I get a call from downtown. I thought we told you to hire a minority. I said, the Chinese American is not a minority, and I don't know who is. So they had no answer to that question. So I spent, um, I got out in 85 on my 60th birthday, and Charlie Lee, I had told him, I said, Charlie, Someday I'm walking in this office and I'm handing you the keys. Ah, you're, you're, you're too young. You're not going to get I'm telling you now. So on my 60th birthday, walked in the office. Charlie, no, no. He said, no, no, I don't want them. Here are the keys, Charlie. 
I don't want a retirement party. I don't want any of that stuff. And I walked out, and I had enough sick, I had enough vacation days and sick days to take me to uh, uh, March of '85. I left on my birthday in October of '84, my 60th birthday. So I uh, retired, and so Kevin was home with us, and. Uh, we would go to Florida every year. My wife was a good help then, and so we would go to Florida for the winter. Kevin came down one winter with us, and we drove down, and he drove back with us. So eventually, I said, oh, hell, I'm not going to be taking care of property now. Uh, I said, let's get a smaller, we had a four-bedroom house there. It was a beautiful place. So we decided Kevin bought the house from us, and he looked like he was going to be a confirmed bachelor until we, they fixed him up with a blind date one day. And but a dumb lady girl, I wish you had me. Yeah, a fine name there. And uh, so uh, we moved to a place called Rob Roy. And uh, at the time, it had formerly been a 27 hole golf course, and now it was nine holes. And so we said to Kevin, You want to come with us? We'll get a bigger unit. And uh, the price was out of this world, 84 or 5 at that time. So we got a two bedroom, two bath. I've been there 26 years now. My wife, I told you, was sick, and so... But it was a good move going out to Rob Roy. Yeah, yeah. When, um, when you met your wife in the, in the hospital and you were visiting yeah. young Gibbons, that was before you went in the service? Yes. Okay. That was uh, like April or May before I went in the service. So. And, uh, did you have her in mind then when you were in the service? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. No, but you didn't well, believe when, like when, yeah. when I found out from uh, her brother that, that her boyfriend is a fair trooper, and I said, I'm not going to get him. But, no, yeah. I didn't write to her anything then. Yeah. It's when I found out that he was killed, and I wrote to her sympathy note, and then she wrote back, and that's, that started it. Yeah. 62 years of marriage. Yeah. Yeah. And it's Mike's. Mike's dad. Mike Gibbons' his father. I was wondering. Yeah. 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 Mike Gibbons' was dad was the lad who was in the hospital. Yeah, we called him Red. He had a knee operation. He was a good basketball player, but he got jammed up with the knees. He got he went to DePaul. About seven of them went to DePaul from St. Philip. De Benedetto, Kahan, uh, Condon, Gibbons, uh, and uh, but uh, the knee he, he didn't make it with the knee. So then he was like Irish. And then he went to work at the retirement board as a young eighteen year old punk. Or he had been in the Navy, I'll take it back my life. And he worked his way. I can remember when I lived with him, he'd get a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning. Red? What? Computer, and nobody knows what the hell to do. Your computer's not working. we got to get this in. I'll be there. he get in his car and go there. Because he had studied everything about computers. Not a college student, but he knew all about computers. And he worked his way up from the lowest job to the chief officer of the place and so on. Great guy. When you, when you took that great train ride, oh, that you thought it was heading for Great Lake. Yeah. And then it was, maybe it's going to San Diego, yeah. and then it's going to Spokane. Yeah. yeah. Was that the first time you ever were away from home for any length of time? No. I had gone to St. Ambrose. So you had that experience. Homesick. Yeah. Father came and got me. During the war, the 1850 mile train ride, not a bit homesick. It's funny, it must happen in you, and once you get out of it. Yeah, uh, but it must have been quite an experience meeting all the meeting, meeting people from all over the country. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the, funny, the, biggest surprise that, the biggest surprise at Ferry and Idaho, the guy below me, his name was John Ozio. He was from Chicago. Two o'clock in the morning, I hear a commotion. I said, John. What's what's going on? Go back to sleep. That's the Mormons. They're playing dice. I said, playing dice? He says, they love to gamble. They, they, at home, they couldn't gamble. They couldn't drink. They couldn't do anything. Now they got freedom. They go wild. <laughs> That's a good one. The, uh, it's amazing talking to the, um, the World War II veterans. Your generation was... Uh, Greatest generation. You were. And you were had great high school educations. You were so competent. And you get into an army or a navy or an air force and you get these different jobs and you can adapt and right. form a unit. 
and go forward and, and not question and accomplish and we did our job and we came home. It's just amazing. And uh, I wasn't sorry I didn't go to officer's training because uh, from DePaul, they had the ASTP for the Army, Army Service Training Program, and they also had a Navy deal and you could go to John Carroll. All my buddies went there and so on. And I thought about it and I said, I don't know, I, I think I'd rather just be an enlisted man. My dad was an enlisted man, so I and I was young, I really didn't know. And that's what they got, the 90 day wonders. On our ship now, they went 90 days to college, these guys, and they were made ensigns. And they were sent out to battleships, destroyers, cruisers. You're in charge of communication, you're in charge of engineering. They didn't know what the hell was going on. And uh, they had to run their ship, uh, certain parts of it, and I said, I don't think I'm ready for that. Mr. McCann, when you taught at, uh, at the academy, what subjects did you teach? Civics and English. Civics and English. And my prize student, Father John Smith, Maryville. Wow. And I said, Jesus, wow. Father, if I'd known that you'd be, I should have given you an A, you'd be a bishop by now. He said, I don't want to be the bishop. <laughs> That's a great student. That's terrific. Yeah. Wow. Four years there, I taught civics and English and vocational guidance. And I still, I go back to the reunion, and Kevin and I went with me in October uh, for the reunion, and Jim Maniola, and he's dead now. You remember Jim Maniola from the academy? I remember the name. Oh, yeah. He, he went from the academy to the university at Registrar. But so what a terrific guy. He died at 90. And um, so we went to the academy reunion, and matter of fact, uh, they're having another one next October, and it's, uh, what's the Irish place, Kevin? It's corned beef? Harrington's. Harrington's corned beef and Kevin. I really like that. That was the only faculty guy I left. They're all dead. All the priests that I knew from the academy, and uh, doctor and, uh, from the university and so on, all gone. Well, is there anything, Kevin, you, is there any subjects you think we should have covered, or has anything come to mind? Well, we covered quite a bit. It's, it's nice hearing these things again that we've heard, uh, especially with the grandchildren. And I went on the internet to show them the things about the USS case and different things that way. And uh, it's good that he has a lot of good memories about it because you hear of war and all the bad things about it. But there's a certain camaraderie, I think, that was built with his yeah. mates and different people like that. that he, uh, we had, uh, you know, for a lot of fronts for a lot of years on that. Still have on my wife. So, but, uh, you know, it's... Uh, I repeat the words of, excuse me, Luke Aaron. Is that 1939? Yeah, he's a day. Uh, Luke Aaron's day. He's dying of an incurable disease. Now it's called Luke, Luke, Luke Aaron's disease. And his answer was, I consider myself the luckiest man in a lot. That's how I feel. So I have my wife, I have my family, eight granddaughters, one more beautiful than the other. Great. I'll agree with that. <laughs> well, that's, that's a beautiful note on which to end this interview. Thank you, Mr. McCann. I don't want to keep you that. No, no, we're just uh, returning to the interview here for uh, a minute. We've been uh, discoursing pleasantly and many of the wonderful uh, ideas and notes in uh, Mr. McCann's life and uh, Kevin and I are both agreed he would have made a wonderful officer in the Navy. Um, and then we were just moving on to the GI Bill and uh, Mr. McCann, as all the other vets do, speaks highly of the GI Bill because in your case... Well, was, my father couldn't afford it uh, after I came out of service uh, in uh, January of 46. Uh, times weren't that good that they you know, although it was, it was much cheaper tuition, but uh, the GI Bill opened the door for me. I would never have gone for a master's degree. I would never have gone for a specialist degree. Was your master's degree in education? Education. education. Right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it was a wonderful deal. And we got books and supplies and $75 a month. And $75 a month took care of my dates and the whole bit. And it was wonderful. Yeah. And... Um, in effect, uh, so they, the GI Bill ensured that you had a strong start, a timely start in education. Absolutely. And your son Kevin, he's in the field of right 
education. Follow me. Yeah. And it's con and he has a connection to right. a principal after a better principal than I was. And a connection to DePaul University right. continues. Yeah. And he won. If you not don't remember this, he won a twenty-five thousand Milken Award for teachers back what year? Uh, ninety ninety-one. Oh, the Milken. Yeah. Okay. Twenty-five thousand yeah. cash. My wife took good care of it. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't married then, were you? Oh, just before. Yeah, yeah very good. Yeah. 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 Well, it was a nice experience today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Well, I understand when you say you're the luckiest man in the world. That's right. Going with Garrett, I understand why you say that, sir. Thank you very much.